right, there we go. All right, so right now we're going to bring in uh, Mr. Rowe because I've I'm, I'm been dying to hear this conversation that we're going to have tonight um, about this conversation. Uh, good evening, Mr. Rowe. How are you? I'm, do I'm doing great, Brother Hassan. I'm doing great. Uh, appreciate the invitation. Uh, hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. Uh, I can hear you all, and uh, I am truly grateful to be a part of this program this evening and um, excited to really have this conversation. How much time do we have, by the way, because that, that will help me be uh, laser focused and not all over the place. Is it uh, a, a half an hour, 45 minutes? What, what, how much time do we have? Yep, we got about a half hour. Uh, okay, okay, good. Okay. 35 minutes. Okay. okay. Well, again, I, I'm grateful to be here, you all. I, I get the chance to see our former uh, mayor, uh, Sister Sheila Dixon, um, uh, and, and we've seen each other before in, in the community from time to time and truly grateful that she's still ever present doing important work and doing critical work on behalf of our community, city, and our people. And so it's always good to be in her presence. And Hassan, it's, sorry, I don't know much about you, my brother. I've heard about you. Uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll be uh, able to learn more about the work that you're doing. I know if you're connected to uh, our, our former mayor, I know she's not going to be hanging with just anybody. So she is, and I know you are in good company and learning as much from her as she is probably learning from you as well. So again, grateful to be here and ready to get started with our conversation. Great, great. Yeah, I have to keep him straight. I have to keep him straight. <laughs> Oh, yeah. keep it straight, huh? We right. learn from each other. That's he, right. He's, he's sort of a young Richard Rowe. In oh, some okay. Because, okay. okay. you know, we go way back when your hair was dark. That's right. So, he, you know, back when, when folks were really committed, not just oh. verbally, but physically oh. out there, rolling oh. up their sleeves. Oh. Well, and I like to think that I keep her more connected to the streets. Even though okay. if I go in the streets, I'm taking her with me because them <laughs> they mess she, with her on the <laughs> and, and she's, all. she's not afraid. And she's not afraid. Has never been afraid oh, no. to go into the streets. Oh, absolutely. The, the streets and sweets, whatever. Mm -hmm. We were we were campaigning, and she would tell the dope boys, "Take the cigarette out your mouth, pull your pants oh, yeah. up, get to you oh, know." Man. And and you know, you and I go say that we it's gonna fight if not guns <laughs> going on us. She says no. it in this, yes, ma'am. Madam Mayor, even if they don't know or know right. her, they recognize and then they, you know, you can see that they fall in line. So it's right. never been a problem and an issue. Um, so getting the conversation off, talk to us about this uh, op-ed that you had in the Baltimore Sun, this conversation uh, with Baltimore and what what prompted you to, to, to pen that uh, beautifully written piece, by the way, um, and what was you know, the meaning behind it. Thank you, Brother Hassan. Um, it was motivated, the letter was motivated by three things, pain, anger, and love. Pain that I continue to endure watching our children fail or and suffer in a system that has not been good to them um, and not been uh, what the system must be in order for our young people to come out whole, healthy, uh, and prepared to, to take on the world. So I'm, I'm painful that that's what I am confronted with on a daily basis. I know that a, a statistic that causes me to be angry is one regarding reading and math proficiency. You know, when we look at a proficiency score, reading proficiency score, that where only 14% of our students are reading proficient, meaning that they, that 88% or 86% of them are not reading at grade level, that causes tremendous anger. And good thing that the anger that I have is controlled anger because there is anger, no doubt. But in my right ear, there are the ancestors talking to me from Aza Hilliard to Dr. Nye Bakbar to Ida B. Wells. So they're in one ear. And in another ear, there's the beautiful music of John Coltrane and, and Miles Davis and some of those great uh, um, Ella Fitzgerald and Nina Simone. And so in my ears, there are our great ancestors constantly keeping me centered and focused on what it is that I can do in this world to make certain that our young people, our children, our most precious, precious gifts 
you know, are protected, are given as much support as they can be given, are loved, respected, and valued. That's the anger, that's the pain, and the love. This was a love letter to our, our young people, to our students. Uh, students, uh, we don't say it enough, but we love you all. We don't hear enough from uh, enough from uh, from many of us on a consistent basis. So this was my attempt to speak on behalf of all the adults. And Sister Dixon, uh, Mayor, uh, former Mayor Dixon, said it correctly. This was a letter to everybody who uh, claims that they are of adult status. That we haven't done everything we need to do for our children. For our young people, how dare we sit on the sidelines if that's what you're doing? How dare we not step up, not lean in, not not basically lift them up every single day and let them know that we will not accept their failure and that we're going to do everything to make certain that we wrap our arms around them and be there for them every step of the way. So again, they come out of these schools prepared and ready to take on the world, not just Baltimore City, but the world. So the love, that, that was the love part of the motivation, love, pain, anger. Chris Rock once said that the angriest person on the planet, uh, uh, and, and Sister Dixon might know this, and Hassan, you might have heard Chris Rock say this in one of his stand-up acts. He said that the angriest man, uh, person on the planet is a black man 65 years or older. I'm over 65 and I am angry because we've seen so much. So I've seen too much and I'm tired and I'm upset that our children, that, that stat alone should have caused us to really say no more, enough is enough, we're not gonna take it anymore. That one stat, where are black children going, black and brown children going in this world in 2022, unable to read at grade level? Mm -hmm. They should be, should be reading, Sister Dixon knows that prior, prior, I mean, prior to the 80s and 70s and so forth, we're sending children out into the world who could read two and three, four grades above grade level. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the that's the world we came from. So how dare we can sit on the sidelines, Brother Hassan? Look at a stat like that, or look at another stat. I'm in the mental health fields, or another stat. Black suicide rates are going up. One of the leading causes of suicide, of, of, of one of the leading causes of death for our young people, nine nine years to twenty four years old, is suicide and homicide. How can I, and how can any of us, sit by? and watch this devastation, abomination take place against our young people and not say something, not do something, and not just one time, at one time something. I'm talking about to lean all the way in and say to them, no more, we heard you when that uprising took place a few years ago, what were our young people doing? They were throwing bricks and bottles and sticks at the system. Mm -hmm. So and, and actually, they, they were that and 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 breaking into um, right. pharmacies, getting right. the various uh, prescriptions, which now more young people are on some type of not more, but but the, uh, quite a few are on some kind of substance, uh -huh. and really that was a time to to kind of make that switch, particularly with being not on the national scene, but also um, with the resources that we were getting. We've got more resources now than we have had in a long time. Because mm -hmm. as you lose population in the city and, and in surrounding counties, you lose certain resources and general fund to put money into different pockets and back, back, Back when I was young, there was close to a million people in Baltimore City. Mm -hmm. So the resources were there. Then we went through a period of, uh, of a recession when people started fleeing the city. And that money then went to the county because your, ta your, your tax dollars, your piggyback tax, your property tax goes to where you live. More and more, that was depleted from the city. That's why Schmoke had to take the route he did with the state partnership because of the schools. He didn't want to give up that control, but for the state to give money to the city, that was the deal that Pete Rollins said. You, hey, we, nah, we're going to take control with this partnership. And, and now, you know, the resources that are out there 
that are available. And, and yes, we went through COVID. And even though I know that, you know, every child didn't have someone sitting on their lap, making sure they were learning. Right when we got out back up into school, that money should have been put into keeping those kids longer in school, giving them the mental health resources that are needed. I mean, all of that. You know, I understand right now, a lot of the money hadn't even been spent. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Rowe, I, 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 looking yes, at your, your opinion piece, it, it, you, you talk about that to the student, you will likely discover that large numbers of other classmates are no longer enrolled in city schools because the schools failed them, both academically and or maintained a culture and climate that contributed to increased levels of traumatic distress and anxiety. And having a conversation with a school board member just this morning and un them understanding how the school has failed our children, how do we then one fix that and how do you how do you bring people as the mayor was just talking about how do you bring people into baltimore or keep them from leaving baltimore who have children in a school system that many including those who serve on the school board admittedly say have failed them well, well former mayor sheila dixon and i hopefully she won't mind me calling her sister dixon because i feel close enough to her to to view her as my sister in the most um, highest sense of respect. She said it. I mean, again, if what, what causes people to leave a city? Violence in schools. If your schools are not up, up to par, people will leave if they can, Brother Hassan. And if the violence appears to be out of control and intractable, people will try to get away, try to leave as fast as they can. And if they, if, if, if a lot of folks, if they could leave, you know, you, talk, you think the census, the last census saw a reduction of what, nine, 10,000 folks leaving mm -hmm. within that 10 year time span, it would be many more. You know, so if in fact, so that's one issue that we don't have enough time to really go take a deep dive into the school system and, and the violence. I mean, that's another issue. But if in fact, this is a real, another serious issue for me with the schools. And, I, and keep in mind, I'm not pointing to the schools only. I said every adult, that means every adult in every system is complicit in my opinion. And I know I will get in trouble for saying that, but every adult in every system, health, DJS, uh, social services, all of these systems are not working together. They are not uh, laser being focused on the health and well-being of our young people who've experienced tremendous emotional uh, trauma, have deep emotional wounds, uh, being neglected, even in the homes, the adults in the homes. I'm, so I don't leave anybody out. The homes is where everything starts. And there is a concept in the mental health field, and I know you all heard this, adverse childhood experiences. The key word, in, in, there are three key words, adverse, bad, uh, un unacceptable, uh, uh, adverse childhood, happens in childhood experiences. And if you don't address those adverse childhood experiences in childhood, then children carry those deep emotional wounds into adulthood if, they, if it's not treated, if it's not dealt with. But, the, but a, a key point I want to make, if nothing else, we have a school system, you all, and I don't have to, I know I'm speaking to the choir, we have a school system where the educators in the school system don't send their children to the schools where they teach. Now, some of them who have children in the public schools might teach, send them to the citywide schools, the Poly, the Western, you know, the City College. I mean, they might send them there, but in terms of the other citywide schools, the Booker T's, the Douglas's, et cetera, we don't have many educators who send their children to the schools where they teach. That is what? That, that is abominable. That is egregious, that if you think highly of your system, why aren't you sending your children to that system? So that's the school systems, the school system needs to admit that that is the case or the objective reality that we are confronted with right now. So I would wanna make that case and simply say to the school system, you got to own up to what you have done or what you haven't done. 
And I don't hear that enough from the school system administrators. I don't hear that enough from the teachers. We all should be walking out of these of these schools and saying, look, we, we failed our children. A $1.3, $1.4 billion budget. Uh, um, Jeffrey Canada once said, and he's the brother who basically created the children, uh, Harlem Children's Zone. He said that the only system in the world that can get a have a budget of $1.3 or $1.4 billion and fail every year is a school system in every urban center. Think about that that statement. It fails, but it continues to get what budget? It just continues to get funded every single year. Yep. And there is nothing that we are doing as a collective. This has this will take the collective to simply say enough is enough, and we're not going to let this system fill our children anymore, along with the other systems that are pretty much doing the same thing. So I don't want to get this. I don't want to just focus on. I, I want to focus on the schools. My letter was written to the stu students in Baltimore City Public Schools, but I want everybody to know that all of us are complicit in the um, in the devaluation of our young people in this city. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's that's true, and you're right. Um, and the reason why a lot of the teachers and administrators' kids don't go to the school because, except for some of the, the probably the CEO, if you did a survey to find out what counties they lived in, mm. I guarantee the the minority of them would live in Baltimore City. Mm. <clears throat> yep, mm -hmm. <laughs> because one of the flight the flight back. 20, 30 years ago was African-American middle class. I grew up um, in West Baltimore from, from seventh grade, sixth grade to um, graduating from high school. I lived in Ashburton. That was a community that was made up of mostly professional teachers, administrators, yes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Once the elder people became older and um, their children left, um, the city and fleet, you know, went to the county. So, so their kids go to the county school, and now you're seeing some effects in Baltimore County, having some of the same challenges that we're having in Baltimore City. Great. Um, one of the things you noted in your letter was about the uh, mental health services, mm -hmm. and one of the things that you know I, we were just talking before the show started um, about uh, these conferences. Um, one of the things that I tried to focus on as mayor um, is had the opportunity to go visit other cities. And when I was in Chicago, we went and visited um, community schools. I was part of, this was even before I was mayor, city council president. There was an effort to create community schools in Baltimore City. Well, we looked at the model in Chicago where you looked at the makeup of the school and then you provided what the needs were for those schools, if it was mental health services, et cetera, not only just for the child, but for the family. Mm -hmm. The school stayed mm -hmm. open till late mm -hmm. in the evening where you had computer classes, pre-GED classes. This was, it was, a, it, the focus was on the total family. Mm -hmm. And you looked at what the needs were and you brought those needs to that school. A lot of schools didn't close till eight, nine o'clock at night. That's right. <laughs> Had after school activities. You had parents coming in after work, um, learning certain skills in order to enhance themselves as well as their children. So, what happened to that? What you call what I heard you during the mayoral campaign talking about community schooling and well, you, we do have you you um, a number of schools do have community partners because um, I'm part of a team called Hands Across Baltimore. My nephew was a former police officer and Lieutenant Jones, who used to run the PAL program. And now we have a component PRP, where we're working with social workers and therapists. And Richard, this is something that um, mm -hmm. I, I challenge you on as well as um, where we're now in three schools working with the principal and the partners. So there are community schools, but what I notice is at some of the schools that we're working with, the, it's the coordination of the services and, and really making sure that the families understand what's available. Because when you say mental health to some African-Americans, like we were dealing with some, some families before school started at the back to school efforts, and a number of the parents, particularly women, would say, well, I'm gonna have to check with their father because mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. their mental health. Um, he didn't, you know, 
he might not support having therapeutic right. services for for the child, even though the child and the family needed it. And I should, I mean, and I, and I hear you loud and clear because again, we the stigma is still attached to mental health. The stigma is still attached to getting treatment or getting support, uh, dealing with your mind, body, and spirit, and your soul. And we are still stuck in a kind of, uh, of, of a historical trap with regards to we knew in, in the past that, you know, talking about mental health or talking about health period, you know, was a, a taboo because we had issues with how we were diagnosed, how we were treated in these facilities and so forth. And many times we were, didn't have access to these facilities, but here we are now in 2022. And I'm simply saying to everybody in our community that our children, I mean, it, it's not just me. I mean, we have national entities that are simply saying our children are suffering from anxiety, chronic stress, depression, and suicide ideation. That's not me, that's not Madam Dixon, that's not you, Hassan, that's what these national entities, public and private are saying that they should all be screened. But as she indicated, there are PRP programs at some of our schools. Some of them are doing good. Some of them are not. We don't have evidence enough. We don't have the prime facie evidence with most of our interventions today that would point to impact, would point to success. We simply are not demanding that. And so we have these services. And she's right again about more money pouring into Baltimore. It's not a money issue, in my opinion, in Baltimore. It is the will of the people. It is the coordination of services. It is holding folks accountable, holding systems accountable, holding budgets accountable, and dealing with practices and policies. It's the Black Butterfly. If you read that book by Dr. Lois Brown, he has summed it up in terms of what has happened to many of these cities across the country. Structural racism, all these things that we lift up and talk about from time to time, time to time. But we haven't de decided that enough is enough. And my letter was, was simply attempt to say, okay, when is enough enough to my own people? Again, I understand because, you know, I'm not talking, this letter wasn't written to white folks per se. Yes, they are the adults and they run corporations. They run entities as well, white led organizations, et cetera, et cetera. So they should be involved too at some point and in some way, but in a very sincere way, in a very intentional way, deliberate way. But I don't have time really to try to convince them that our children are worthy of what? The love, the respect, and the valuing that all children deserve, their children get, their children deserve. I'm speaking to right now to my community and saying, when are we going to simply say enough is enough and lean all the way in and let no more children fail within our school system? We have four HBCUs in the state, two in this city. They have Beautiful buildings, schools of education, where are they? You know, so I'm speaking to everybody uh, in our space to decide or to determine where can they fit in to turn this around. And there are interventions, Madam uh, Mayor um, Sheila Dixon knows about some of them. I know about quite a few of them. We got to make sure they're coordinated and we got to hold everybody, all the systems accountable to this task at hand. So based on your letter, and I saw the interview that was done, and I saw the suggestions that you also made in the letter, what has happened as a result? Have people, have organizations, have groups approached you and others to say, okay, what's the next step? How, what, is it, how, what can I do? How can I get involved? You have some of that, um, Sister Sister Dixon. You have some of that, and quite. I mean, I'm very grateful for the response because the response has been overwhelming. I mean, folks have simply said, "Richard, what can we do? What's the next step?" You know, it's interesting that you know we are eager to really. Many, some of us are eager to really resolve some of these issues, but we need to be clear that it's going to take what a coordinated effort. So we are meeting with some groups. We are hearing from a, a number of different folks to really plan this out so that it's not something we start and it's, you know, it starts and then with stops, you know, almost as fast as it starts. So we gotta be planful and we've gotta be aware that there are some pieces to this puzzle that has to be brought to the table. And there has to be this kind of intentionality amongst ourselves that we're going to go as far as we can uh, with the resources that we have at our disposal. So the Black Mental Health Alliance 
is convening folks who are interested in doing the other work in terms of how do we really address the issues around mental health? Uh, how do we deal with uh, reading proficiency or literacy? Uh, that's a big piece of the puzzle. How do we deal with families that are having issues of uh, basically figuring out how to be better parents? So it's a different pieces of the puzzle that we are taking a look at. Parenting, school system, community, uh, coordination, collaboration, and um, and resources at our disposal that we can use in order to help our young people succeed. So I would say this letter was written on what, April, October 14th, October, yeah. October, about two weeks later. And we're still moving, still talking, uh, and still trying to figure out what the action plan has got to be in order to really maintain momentum and maintain this call to action so that we don't basically burn ourselves out or stop because we didn't have all the resources, all the pieces of the puzzle together at the same time. My question, I, and I hear y'all and I get that. My question though is this, regardless of, I hear the pieces from the outside, right? Of individuals willing to help and to assist, but how do you deal with the core, what I believe is the core problem within our school system? And I know it goes beyond schools, but our children, the violence, like clearly they have a serious violence issue within our young people. And it's not just uh, racial. If you look at young people today, I personally think the video games play a huge part in it that they're consuming on a, I mean, 16, upwards of 16 to 20 hours a day on these things. And if you see these mass shootings across the country, many of them are mimic off that. But look at the videos we're seeing coming out of schools like Mervo, which was once one of the premier schools in our city, which now on a regular basis, a student is either shooting someone or they are coming together and beating on children mercilessly. And mm -hmm. so how do you get at that? Like I, that's, that's, that's the, to me, that's the core question that I think a lot of parents and a lot of citizens would have. It's an issue, but it's, it's an issue along with all the other issues that we've lifted up. I mean, Julian Bond, a powerful civil rights leader, once said that true violence is sending children to school for 12 years and only giving them a six, sixth grade education. So we got violence coming from all sides. Yes, we have violence uh, taking place in our schools. Uh, no doubt, Brother Hassan, that's, that's clear and that's present danger. You know, but we've got to deal with this is a complex kind of issue. We've got to deal with that violence. And how do you deal with that? You know, we have restorative justice programs in our schools. We have conflict mediation going, taking place in our schools. You have these interventions going on in our schools. You have PERP programs. So all these interventions are designed and supposed to address some of the violence that we're seeing. But the streets have now entered the schools. The schools have now entered the streets. You got this uh, back and forth uh, in terms of what's, uh, what's uh, um, what's tolerated, uh, what will be acceptable, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. We've got to deal with uh, issues related to suspensions, all these things that we at one time had some control over. But it seems like there's a, you know, a lot of the things that we're talking about are not coordinated and it appears to be out of control. So I see on television incidences of violence taking place in our schools that are hurtful and painful to watch. But we got to know how many resource officers are in school. There should be a resource officer in all of our schools. There should be, um, you know, mental health professionals in all of these schools. Not just one, not just two. We got a, a school with several thousand students or 800 students. What is the ratio of resource officers to, you know, that population? We've got to basically figure some things out and be clear about what it takes in order to mitigate and lessen the violence in the hallways and the violence taking place in classrooms where children are not getting everything they should be getting. Now, lastly, I will say this. We put too much on our school system uh, to, to handle. My hope would be teach our children to do what? Read, write, compute, and learn about themselves, mm -hmm. identity, purpose, direction. If the schools did that, that would be uh, a progress for me. But we've given the schools everything to deal with from feeding our children, the mental health services, the family engagement, everything has now been laid at the steps of our mm -hmm. school system. 
they are overwhelmed, overloaded. Our teachers are overwhelmed, overloaded. Uh, administrators have some issues regarding trauma them, themselves. I talk to teachers. A lot of them are tra have been traumatized. So again, Hassan, I wish I could give you that one answer or two steps to deal with the violence, but it's going to take, again, everybody making a decision that our systems with an S have failed our children. And what are we going to do collectively to turn this around? And my letter addressed a couple of issues, a couple of solutions, but there are a lot more that if we had more time, I could suggest and I could offer. And if anybody wants to really figure, learn more about what some of those other interventions are, there's a concept called healing-centered engagement. We gotta heal our young people. Our young people come to school fighting. They're coming because they're suffering from grief, from emotional wounds, from trauma, all those kinds of things. So they're coming ready to do what? To fight it out. Not to talk it out, but to fight it out. Fight it out. So yep. Those are the kinds of things that we got to deal with. Yep. And no, and you're right. The, the, the school, the administrators, teachers, or well, the teachers in particular, they need to be dealing with the education aspect of it. And then all these other pieces and other yep. professions need to deal with these other issues. You, you're so right on that. And, um, you know, along with I was reading an obituary. Um, Richard, did your wife go to Bethel at one time? Yes, we did. We went to Bethel. Mm -hmm. Right, under Bishop um, Bryan. Richard, Bishop Bryan and uh, Bishop Reed. Bishop Reed. Uh, I thought so. Reed. I thought so. Greg Reed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, one, I, I just bring that up because I remember under Bishop Bryan, Bishop Bryant was focusing on mental health, him and Cecilia, because remember mm -hmm. Cecilia had a women's ministry. And it was through that women's ministry that really al allowed me to deal with a host of issues that I had going on that I didn't, I mean, I knew I, it was there, but I didn't realize the, the depth of it, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 helped me to, to do a lot of healing. And, and, you know, sometimes people rely on the black church, but but also realizing that I needed to go get mental health. But right. but but you're right, because I was in the store on Saturday. I was running a couple of errands and I was in a store and I don't know if it was a grandmother or a mother. I'm not sure. But one of the children was sick and she was trying to identify this medicine and she was on the phone with somebody else. And then she was yelling and cussing at two other kids mm -hmm. that were with her. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it took everything I had to say. I, you know, I know you got a lot going on. You got this baby that's sick and you're trying to get this cough medicine for get the fever down. I was like, why are the baby in here in the store in the public? Anyway, but that's another issue. But now you cursing these other two kids out and they even ain't do nothing. They just being kids. Right. You know, active, running around, getting in the little cup something and you on the daggone phone. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, that's why kids come to school in a lot of ways the way that they do because of what's happening in the home. And I was reading uh, my mother's obituary the other day because I found a bunch of material. And my mother was a parent liaison worker in Baltimore City Public School. And she used to go and Murphy home the projects. Mm -hmm. She had a pair of scissors with her. Now, I'm, we used to say, I'm scissors, I'm going to do anything. But she would go and visit the families. And she brought mm -hmm. in um, programs in the school to help parents you know, to show them how to do parenting. I mean, they took all that stuff away mm -hmm. to work mm -hmm. with young parents. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's, it, we got a lot. It's a lot. And, and I they wish say I, it takes a village. It really I, takes a village today. I, I was getting ready to, 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 to share that because there's an African proverb that says the ruin of a nation begins in the homes of its people. Now, there would be some psychologists would say, Richard, that's deficit based not strength-based, but deficit-based, okay, I'll, I'll go along with that. If you all want to say it's deficit-based, I can unappreciate that and understand that, but the ruin of a nation begins in the home of its people. Love-centered or love-based or strength-based would just say the success of a nation begins in the homes of its people. So we've got to heal the families, we got to heal the individuals in the families, and we got to heal the village. The village is has suffered traumatic trauma uh, over and over and over and over again. Entrance poverty, 
there's a concept called adverse community environments, injustice, structural racism, all those things that we really have yet to address you all. And as long as those things haven't been, have, are not addressed, then we're going to continue to see what we see and we're going to continue to experience what we're experiencing. So there's a lot that we could continue to talk about, uh, but none of us on this call are talkers, we are doers. And I'm gonna keep trying my best to connect with people who are ready to roll up their sleeves uh, and simply get this work done on behalf of our young people and behalf of our community. Our young people are our future. We've got to see that. We got to understand that. We've got to know that, believe that. And if we don't do everything we can to prepare them and get them ready to run the world and to, to live the most, uh, uh, there's the concept, Dr. John Trudell, who was a powerful psychologist in this area. He had a concept called optimal mental health, the highest mm -hmm. level of spiritual, emotional, psychological, physiological, and emotional aliveness is his mm -hmm. definition of optimal mental health. That's the direction that the organization that I'm presently working with is trying to lift up, promote, offer trainings to different groups and different organizations. And that's the work that I will continue to do. All right. So for those who are watching the program who want to learn more about the Black Mental Health Alliance, what you're doing to get involved, how can they find out or get more information on it? Please go to our website, www.blackmentalhealth.com. You can basically go there and look at the work that we are currently doing. Uh, my email address is on that site, and uh, please feel free to contact me. My email was um, basically listed at the bottom of the letter that I wrote, and I would encourage those who have not read this letter uh, to read it. You know, I can only put 750 words on paper. <laughs> yeah. I had uh, about 2,000 words uh, that I had to you know, copy and I had to revise or edit. So again, there was a lot more there. And there's a lot more, again, that we could talk about. This is a powerful uh, platform that you all have. And I, again, again, I'm grateful that you all invited me. So the website, Brother Hassan, www.blackmentalhealth.com. Our executive director, who was two years into the position, Andrea Brown, is truly committed to uh, supporting uh, this work. She is a true collaborator. collaborator wants to be a partner with other organizations. And the African proverb that I lift up all the time that she honors, celebrates, and supports. If we want to go quickly, go go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. That's what we want to do with any and every group, any, any individual who's seeking to solve some of the problems that we are, are having in this, uh, in this city, and in this state, and in this country. So we've got to go together, you all. And that's the, um, that's, that's the, our commitment to to uh, our people. All right. Well, Mr. Richard Rowe, thank you so much for joining the political regulator tonight and talking about that. And we wish you nothing but the best of success, brother. Honor and a pleasure. And I wish you all the best. Be well, be safe, and continue doing this important work of informing and helping our people understand these critical issues and then doing something about them. So, Madam former Mayor Sheila Dixon, my honor to be in your space again, my sister and brother Hassan, it was an honor to be in your space uh, and I wish you all well. Thank you, right. thank you for being here. Take care now, have a good evening everybody. All right, you too. All right, well there you hear it, Madam, Madam Mayor. That was a, definitely an interesting dialogue and conversation. We're definitely gonna hear more about that as well and that leads right into our next segment um, with these wonderful individuals from the Real News Network family. Tonight, <laughs> as promised, we got the, uh, if you don't know who Stephen Janice is in Baltimore, then you aren't living in Baltimore. Plain <laughs> That's all it is to it. You, you just aren't, you don't watch the news, you don't read the news, you don't know nothing about the news if you don't know who Stephen Janice and, and I want to say Tyagram, right? Uh, it's so, Taya, but you Taya. know what? I answered okay. a Taya, though. <laughs> okay. uh, I knew I was going to get it wrong, but oh, no Taya worries. Graham, uh, wonderful investigative reporters, both of them doing great work over there at the Real News Network. They're joining us tonight. So first, we want to welcome you to the Political Regulators. Thank, Thank you, you so much Thanks for, for having us. We us. appreciate it. We really do appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, we definitely, when I saw that you had a premiere coming up, 
I said, well, maybe you can give us a preview of it. Yeah. I know it's serious and exciting and definitely going to be very informative. Well, we certainly sure. hope so. Um, well, yeah, as you know, uh, um, Mayor and Hassan, you know that we've been covering or I've been covering TIFFs and the city's pension for giving out tax breaks for many, many years. And I thought it was time to give this policy sort of the same attention that the media likes to give to crime mm -hmm. and other aspects of Baltimore's life. Because, you know, really, truly, the city makes people rich. Um, and there are many inequities and many, I think, inefficient processes baked into our tax break, sy our tax break system. And of course, I'm sure uh, uh, many of us who remember Recover City Hall, Mayor, you had a commission or a blue ribbon panel that studied, you know, reducing the tax rate. Well, <clears throat> instead of doing that over the successive administrations, we doled out a lower tax rate to rich developers from Towson and made that a city policy with very little oversight and very little transparency. And um, we thought it was time. So, yeah, go ahead. You no, know, go ahead. Go ahead and finish. And then no, we just, we, we when just did talk. it become non-transparent? Because the process always required um, legislation, hearing. Mm -hmm. Well, take, for example, you know, the um, Port Cummington TIF as a good example. Um, you know, Carl Stokes wanted more time because he thought it was too big a deal. And they took it out of his committee and pushed it through the council. Seven years later, they haven't leased a single tenant to Port Covington. Um, for example, with Harbor Point, uh, after they approved the TIF, I asked for jobs reports. They weren't doing jobs reports. Um, and so they finally gave them to me like seven months later. Uh, also, the seven pilots in, in Baltimore that are supposed to the city is supposed to file reports to the state on. Um, when we asked, they hadn't filed the reports since 2018. But even more important, I think, is that I don't get the sense that there is much uh, work done. And for example, just recently in the city council, there was a bill to commission a $30,000 study to find out if TIFs had actually benefited the city. And there was, <laughs> yeah, there was a study that Odette mm -hmm. Ramos introduced for, to study whether or not TIFs had benefited the city, and it right. was rejected by the council. Four to three, as Four a matter three. of fact. Yeah. And we were there in the council chambers yeah. uh, when uh, Councilwoman Ramos uh, brought the bill forward. We were honestly quite shocked um, at the, I would say, the reasons that were given for rejecting her proposal. Um, there was already money, money set aside for budget. Uh, it wasn't going to uh, keep any tips from that were in progress. It wasn't going to impede any progress on tips that were already approved. It was simply a study to see whether or not the city was getting what they were paying for. If we were getting the jobs that we were promised, if it was bringing residents into the city, and if it was helping the surrounding communities flourish. She simply wanted a study and they pushed back against it. I was shocked. Yeah, well, I'm surprised too that the council would push back on something like that. But also, um, as you know, in listening orders might not know that Baltimore Development Corporation and finance should be, it could have provided information about the tips. I understand that right now we're not even collecting the, uh, the taxes from the tip. Mm. Well, you know, Port Covington, I believe, is, is using a special assessment. Uh, what was interesting and I don't want to go too much into all, we have a ton of findings, but for example, in, in Harbor Point, Harbor Point actually um, generated more revenue than, than the debt service necessitated in the deal. However, because they got a enterprise zone tax credit from including Perkins Homes in their statistical area or their census tax, that whole debt was wiped out. Um, and the city, I, I think you know, Mayor, and I'm not sure if this is totally accurate, but I think the city pays half of the enter enterprise zone tax credit, the state reimburses for half. But right, those right. Oh, wow. So because they put Perkins home in it. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Because they put Perkins homes in the, in the in Harbor Point made itself part of the census track of Perkins homes. To Harbor Point qualified, sorry. To purposefully lower the median income so that they would qualify for this. And I think it was roughly $5 million. Yeah, the last. Taxes that weren't paid to the city because yeah. they were able to use this very clever financial maneuver. Right. So. You know, and then there are TIFs like, the, the, as you know, the, the TIF 
the convention center hotel is a TIF, but that's never included in any of the um, estimates on what the city is losing in terms of property taxes. Now, of course, the convention center hotel is being supported by the city. So there are a lot of reasons to raise questions about this um, and just to get a price tag on it, you know? And, and I would just offer this, um, it, there's TIFs and there's pilots. So the TIFs are the tax increment financing, the pilots right. are payment in lieu of taxes, and the Marriott Hotel uh, received the pilot. And essentially this building pays uh, roughly a dollar a year in taxes. And when you think about the value of a building like this, I think it's over $100 million. $130 million. $130 million, thank you. Yeah. So for a building that's worth $130 million and is paying roughly a dollar a year in taxes, and you think of you know, a, a grandma living in a house on Pennsylvania Avenue who's paying roughly $3,000 a year in taxes, to me what this shows is that the tax burden isn't being equitably distributed. And we hear a lot of talk about how we want equity, how we want parity, how we want fairness. Well, to me, that doesn't look like a proper example of fairness when some of the poorest residents of the city are shouldering the tax burden. And to, so wait to a the minute, family, the Marriott the, Hotel is the Marriott Hotel is only paying a dollar. That was a deal that the council worked out in 1998 um, with Paterakis family. Right, and smoke, but I didn't. But I don't recall it where they would just pay a dollar. My yeah. understanding is it was supposed to be increments where the first year it's it increases over a period of time. Mm -hmm. Well, in this particular case, the it, there was this was not one of those incremental. Um, it ended up saving them fifty six million dollars over the life, and they're still getting a, a significant reduction in taxes. I'm not sure if it's exactly. Um, a dollar anymore, but uh, I don't over think it the, is a dollar anymore. Over <laughs> over the life of the deal, it's been fifty six it was fifty six million dollar tax break for that hotel, which just recently sold for one hundred and thirty million dollars. Oh, it, uh, uh, Marriott sold. Yeah, for one hundred and thirty million dollars. Yes, the Paterakis family sold it. Yeah, we should so, have sold the Hilton too. Well, you can't sell the Hilton. You mean the convention center? We could have. We could have sold the. Um, no, the, the problem with the convention center hotel is it still owes four hundred fifty million dollars. You can't sell it right now. You would be upside down. Well, but it's losing money. Right, but so if you sold it, let's say its top value could be fifty, sixty million. Someone's going to be stuck with three hundred million dollar debt because the hotel has not been able to make the interest payments. So the city is on 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 the hook for that at this moment. Yeah. About nine or. $10 million a year and lost all the hot tax as well associated with it. So you can't, I, I mean, you could sell the hotel, but then the city would at least have to eat 150, 200 million dollars in bond debt or, or assume it, I guess, and just pay it just depending on how it, how it works out. So for the viewers, the, the bill that was introduced by Councilwoman Ramos, who was on the program a couple months mm -hmm. ago, spoke about some of the legislation it was actually voted against by Chairman yeah. Eric Costello, yes. City Council Vice President Sharon Green Middleton from the 6th mm -hmm. District, Councilman yes. Yitzi Schleifer from the 5th District, and Councilman Robert Stokes from the 12th yeah. District, where yes. Christopher Burnett, Daniel, Danny McRae, and Ryan Dorsey voted for it. Uh, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so here's the question that I think I, I have most citizens who watch it don't understand a clue about tips and pilots, uh, but they hear it on the news all the time. How do you continuously give tax breaks to these big corporations and businesses and yet an average homeowner or somebody mm. trying to buy mm -hmm. two or three properties can't qualify for those same types of breaks? I mean, that's that's a really good question. And part of the problem is, is that some people aren't willing to use the word tax breaks when talking about tips and pilots. They'll call them financial tools or financial incentives, that, that these are necessities to be able to get people to develop in Baltimore. But what we see in the surrounding counties is that as opposed to giving developers these tax breaks, the developers in the surrounding counties actually have to pay impact fees to the community. So once again, I feel like our city is being taken advantage of, yeah. and, and that's and it's really they're they're putting an incredible burden on you know just like you said, small business owners and property holders, you know, in here in Baltimore. Yeah, I mean, as as we've always thought, you know, Taylor's right. The nomenclature is part of what the problem is, which is they, there's no realistic assessment of what's really going on. Um, there's this fiction 
and I'm, I, the mayor might take exception to my characterization here, but fiction that TIFs are about infrastructure. But if you look at the, the legal paperwork, the financial projections, it has nothing to do with infrastructure. It has everything to do with some assumed value of the property 30 years hence. And they give them all their property taxes up front. There's any person in the city would love to have that. But, but the bottom line driving all of this is the fact that we have twice the tax rate of the counties, which is, I think, something, you know, we could just pass. But as long as we have that tax rate and as long as our tax rate is double, um, I think you're going to see businesses demand um, tax breaks to locate in the city or build in the city. So. Right. But in, in defense of tips and pilots and but there is a period where over a certain amount of years, you have to then start collecting those taxes. But in, in, in a lot of cases where we do the tips and pilots, we don't have to, we don't have in some cases where in the counties, they could potentially, well, they wouldn't, they don't need a check. We don't have cash to give to a development that's going to ultimately generate uh, tax dollars, piggyback dollars, revenues that's going to come back to us. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have, we don't have, we, 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 right. we don't have but, that but we kind were, of resource. But, you also, but we also have to set it up where we are going to ultimately collect on that. Well, Mary, what, what we were talking about is that in the county, like Howard County and other counties, the developers pay the jurisdiction mm -hmm. to develop. It's called but, impact. But you can't compare Bum, um, Howard County with Baltimore City. Well, I'm, I would ask the question, why not? Because look at the income base in Howard right. County. Okay, so you make a perfect point. So you're saying the poorest jurisdiction in the state, being Baltimore, should be paying people to develop, while the richest jurisdiction should be getting paid to develop. How is that ever going to work out for the city of Baltimore? The poorest getting poorer while the rich getting richer. That's never going to work out. That is a bad plan, I think, fiscally for the city. Um, well, I, I can I, see what you're talking about. You're talking about yeah. the reality of it. The reality is, yes, Baltimore has been characterized as this failed city, and thus it must pay developers to develop. But when you think about it big picture, it will never work. I mean, it's not going to work. But it's we're not, not just paying. It, ultimately, they have to pay back. Well, ultimately, they are supposed to pay back. But what we have found is that sometimes, like what Steve was talking about, the $5 million that were abated with an enterprise zone yeah, credit. I mean, so they, even when they are supposed to pay back, they find ways not yeah, to. Yeah, that would have. That, that, well, but see, then I put that on us. I put that on the city because knowing that we're doing this deal in order for us to generate ultimately X amount of dollars, that to per put Perkins Homes in it. Who put Perkins Homes in it anyway? Um, well, the developer did, and the BDC. No, 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 no. Somebody, somebody, one of the mayors, and I can't remember. Well, that would have been Stephanie's. It was under Stephanie's Stephanie, administration. Right. Was it Stephanie who who gave up Perkins Homes, or was it Catherine well, who gave the, up Perkins the, Homes? The, the Harbor Point tip happened in the administration of Stephanie Wallingsby. Right, Harbor right. Yes. But but yeah, that would have been, that would have been the BDC that would have had to approve that. Then it would have gone to the finance board, which would have approved it, and then ultimately the council. So, um, you know, but as you know, and I think, I don't think you can argue against this. Most of these deals are constructed by the BDC and then presented to council and usually not altered that much from the original deal constructed by the BDC. I mean, no, I, that's not, act, no, that's not, okay, well, well, maybe now, maybe now, I mean, part of, well, part of, part of what I would do when we would get um, when it would come before the council, a TIF or mm -hmm. pilot, there are a couple things as city council president that I would, would require. One, and this doesn't happen anymore. It did mm -hmm. happen, but mm -hmm. we, you know, lost out. Where you talk about equity, they would have to get, and they would have to put money in. They would have to get an African American partner within that development, mm -hmm. and that was a requirement. We could we couldn't be, we couldn't require it by law. But it was encouraged, and those mm. proposals weren't going to be looked at unless you had a black partner, because we needed to create. That was really creating equity. That's the biggest reason why I'm out of public office today. Mm. Wow. When you say that, what do you mean specifically? What, when you're out of public office because do you mean, of do you mean because that because of what I required, and because oh. of what I came up against, and those individuals and i can't point the finger on who 
mm-hmm. who did not want to see that. They didn't want to have to share in their profits with a black company or black individual. Mm. I can see that. Unfortunately, I, Mr. Paterakis, I, Mr. John Paterakis, bless his soul, he realized that that was not going to change, and he did. He brought in Ron, who was part of Harbor East, and and when when Ron threw him under the bus, like he threw me under the bus, he he actually had a a partner in Minnesota who. Um, um, who he had a partner who helped dealt with that part of the Midwest with the bread business, which I never knew until the the deal with Ron went down. Um, and then, of course, in some cases, the President's Roundtable, some of the players there, instead of them playing fair and knowing that they had to put money into the pot in order to, to you know, to then create wealth within that community. I mean, you know, of course, Folks play deals, political deals with each other. But yeah, I I, I push that um, wholeheartedly. Um, and then, of course, you know, the next administrator didn't. Well, I mean, just yes. And I, I would agree, you know, Harbor Point was pretty much bereft of any sort of community benefits agreement mm-hmm. besides the um, living classrooms got some money. But um, the thing is that, um, you know, None of all of this is kind of structural, too, to a certain extent. Like I said, until the city has a tax rate that is equal to the like the idea of having a, a jurisdiction where you step over a line, you pay half the tax rate uh, that that's ever going to create or total growth. And, you know, Mayor, you did have a another blue ribbon panel on, on, on regionalism, which is where, what this really gets to mm-hmm. until we have a regional approach to economic growth. The city is going to suffer, I really think. If you look at it, and it's suffering because these tax breaks are worth hundreds of millions of dollars and we pay for it. The people who live in the city, we pay for it. The people who live here, who own homes, who, who rent, we pay for it. And I don't think I don't think it's a long term healthy policy. But, you know, go ahead. Well, no, I, I think you made a great point. And and you said healthy policy. So mm-hmm. speaking of healthy policy, I certainly would want both of your feedback on this. I'm sure you're familiar mm-hmm. with uh, Renew mm-hmm. Baltimore which recently uh, tried to get uh, their proposal put on the ballot. Uh, They had an initiative in the hopes of dropping um, the property tax rate by about half over uh, over about a period of five years so that we would our property tax tax rate would match the surrounding county. And the goal and the hopes in doing this would be that it would attract uh, it would attract more residents, it would attract small business owners, it would attract development. And then, of course, it would be beneficial for the people who are already property holders here in Baltimore. What do you think of a plan like that? Uh, Professor Stephen Walter, Walters from Loyola had a similar plan, and now Renew Baltimore also has a plan for bro- uh, dropping property tax rates. So what do you two think? Of as that, a former that- as a former mayor and understanding the uh, structural issues we deal with, I signed on to the petition. Oh wow, that's wow. that's great to hear, man. That's really. But they, but they started late. You right. had to get more than ten thousand signatures, right? And um, and we had them actually on our podcast. Oh, cool. oh wow! Oh, that's cool. great. You know, they only they only missed by four hundred, so people were interested. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah! Oh, I know. Well, those reasons it successful was because they didn't understand the creators of it didn't understand the petition process, and so it came about way too late. And when they did, they kind of got caught up with trying to find a group that knew how to do it, knew how mm-hmm. to, to pay a group to go out to get the petitions. And right. So, but yeah, if they start earlier and they do it right, it will get on the ballot the next time around, without a doubt, without a doubt. Mm-hmm. What do you think of the um, overarching uh, policy? Do you think that's something that Baltimore City residents are going to embrace? Do you think it's, I mean, sounds like the mayor signed off on it. What, what do you think? Oh, I, I think that overall, yes, but but people in city government will have a challenge because of structurally how what we're facing now as a city. But right now, a city has a lot of right. money. Yeah, a lot of money that I didn't have. I wish I had my dad. <laughs> I really would have done a whole lot. But um, but still, you still have some of those structural issues. Um, that that has to be dealt with. Some of it but, had been dealt with, um, with with personnel and police and you know employee right. employees have always that's always been a, 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 a challenge. 
but when you have a dwindling tax base, right? You know, well, you're gonna you gotta have to make some decisions, some hard decisions. Let me drill down on what you said because you said that the development business in Baltimore brought you down. So doesn't that mm -hmm. make you think to a certain extent that it needs to be overhauled in some ways? I mean, if if I'm misinterpreting what you said, uh, let me know. But that's kind of what I thought you said, the gist of what you said. Right, but 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 what brought what brought me down was was creating a a, a mechanism where African Americans will benefit from these developments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean that you know. So, no, I understand. Yeah. So, but but even structurally, you know, with the collection process, with these tips and pilots, or adding on additional pieces like the Perkins Square, bringing that piece on Perkins Square piece, they would have just built a new school, a new rec center. They would have been built in a lot of stuff as a result of that over there. Right. Um, I mean, I think they did put some money to be fair into perk into living classrooms, but it wasn't. So right. But th yeah, but everybody puts money into living classroom. I'm not right. talking about living, just living <laughs> classroom. True. I don't That's know. What I'm talking about. about other efforts. No, living classrooms really has a good. Actually, they they lost their it. State Streets money, and they were doing very well. Part with State Streets, but. And and other things. So living classrooms. They funneling money through living classrooms. Cut it out. These people <laughs> no, no, no. Up. They are not. That is not true. No, funneling money not, to uh, what? Funneling no, money they're to not funneling up. money through. Uh, uh, no, they're not. Uh, uh, let's be every real about this. every effort that they take on, they're data driven and they can show right. results. Let's, I let's disagree. Be, I was let's a trustee. Be about this. There's a reason why there's a small group of developers who continuously get rich in this town, who get those tips and pilots. And I hope mm -hmm. that this is a part of your documentary. How many it of is. these groups actually get these tips and pilots, these sweetheart deals, mm -hmm. compared to every other business person? And guess what? Somebody's getting paid off because the council, like you said, they're not asking any questions. The BBC no. comes in front of them. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. Let me put my little pet project in there. No, no nobody's getting paid off. Uh, no, nobody's getting paid off. Man. And the bottom line is, Look at their wait a minute. I, I, I would disagree. I would disagree. Nobody's I mean, getting paid off. But no, no, no. There, and there has been some pilots in communities as well. Where? You, we need to bring Dean Harrison. Did you interview Dean Harrison? Well, who's a black developer, been around for a long time, been struggling. The, the Zenith. Was, right. was one of um, but, Dean yes. Harris's project where the unions invested money into it. Right. Um, over on, in, um, what is it? Was, I think Hill. Was a tip, though. The Zenith was a tip, wasn't it? Or was it a pilot? Was, uh, no, the Zenith was a pilot. Was it a pilot? But 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 yeah. the unions well, put up no. the resources. But you're, you're talking, you know, like we'll, we'll have an estimate um, about how much these small group of developers are getting from this versus what the entire city tax base is getting and it's significant and it's significantly disproportionate and it's significantly unfair. And I think, Mayor, when you say the development system brought me down, it's because it's inequitable, because it's unfair. Mm -hmm. You were trying to make it fairer, yeah. but there's a political economy there that won't allow that to happen. And the fact that it exists and the fact that it's able to perpetuate inequality is what makes it a, a very, I think, destructive policy going forward, what Hassan was talking about. Like someone is getting paid off. I mean, Michael Beatty sold his share of of um, Exxon. of Exxon for two hundred sixty eight million dollars. Why did he need a tip then, if he can walk away with two hundred sixty eight million dollars? You tell Wait me. Wait a minute, Beatty had a share in Exxon. Well, yeah, he owned. No, that was Harbor Point was Beatty's. Right, his, I know it was his yeah. project. So wait a minute, yeah. he sold Exxon. He sold his. Dude. He sold the share in the building. I'm not sure if he sold it in the whole project, but he sold part of the share of Harbor Point for $268 million. Now, I don't know how much money he had, you know, debt he had worked put, put together because that's not publicly disclosed. But I do know he got, you know, a very lucrative tax break from the city of Baltimore. And now he's walking away a ridiculously wealthy man, however it works out. And, you know, if that's the kind of policy we have, why don't we just give that benefit to every, why doesn't every person in this city who lives here and pays taxes deserve the same tax rate as Michael Beatty. If you can answer that question, you know, I mean, he, he used the city to finance that 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 building. 
And yet none of us get that. We, we have to pay our tax. My tax rate keeps going up. It keeps going up and up because, you know, the assessment on my part, uh, our bill. So what, what project are you willing to finance and build? I city. find that if you give me a hundred dollar, hundred million dollar tip, I'll finance and build whatever you want. You know, <laughs> right. It'll be real easy. Because I'll just say Baltimore City said I don't have to pay taxes for 36 years. And even more than that, they're gonna give me all the money up front. I won't have trouble finding a loan. I'll build well, we don't give you the money up front. You've uh, got to guarantee the money. Mayor, that is absolutely untrue. You know they work that way. They they sell the bonds, a hundred million dollar bonds based on the future assessed value of the increment. That is absolutely true. They give you the money up front. That is so, I mean, I can show you the documents. It's absolutely true. You get all the money up front of your- So in your documentary, in your doc, doc, mm -hmm. documentary that you're doing, is it one-sided? Um, do you have interviews no, with folks no. at BDC? Yes, we have We have Jay, Jay Brody. Brody. Jay Brody mm -hmm. is, is in there. So no, it is not one-sided. So do you absolutely. have- it, We have Carl Stokes, Jay Brody. Uh, we uh, interviewed- uh, uh, one of the representatives of Municap. We have represent the head of Municap. So no, it is not one sided. What, but I, I, I want to make sure the record is correct. When you say they don't give them the money up front, that's just not true. I'm just pointing out a fact. I'm not arguing for or against tips, but I'm saying that is that is just a fact. And if you say, well, we're you going to do a project? I'll say, yeah, give me a tip and I'll do a project. But I know I can't get a tip. And well, I mean, come on. You, are you a developer, Steph, Stephen? I'll learn. <laughs> okay, we'll learn, and then let's see. You come up with a plan and come back. But well, see, but I, mean, you see, I don't know. That's the Adam. I'm not at the city. That makes. I mean, okay, never mind. I, so, I well, did you did you interview Dean Harrison? We can't interview. No, we did not interview Dean Harrison. Oh, that would have been we, good. We asked Michael Beatty to interview. He would not talk to us. Well, why would he talk to you? I wouldn't talk to you either. But a Dean Harrison who who's who struggled year after year after year as a black developer in this city mm -hmm. would have been an ideal person to talk to, to look well, at both sides. Right. But I think, I think Jay Brody- Michael Beattie's not going to talk to you. Jay Brody represents probably, he was one of the most influential people. He was the head of president of BDC. Yeah, he yeah, uh, no, And you know, yeah. we only have a certain amount of resources to do this. So I thought Jay Brody was a good representative of the development community in terms of- Well, he's so. a good representative of BDC. Mm -hmm. Not of the development community. Well, I mean, the, because we were focused on, um, you know, Harbor Point, we thought Michael Beatty would be the person because it was his project. And if he's not going to talk to us, it's oh, not yeah, no, he won't talk to y'all. <laughs> so was it was the question ever answered? And maybe mm -hmm. y'all know this. It may be in the documentary. Maybe we got to wait till it comes out. No. <laughs> Why is there a person? Because mayors change. Obviously, we've seen what five or six of them in the past. Mm -hmm. 10 years is there a person in city government that tracks how much money is supposed to come back from these tips and pilots mm. 20 30 years from that like so if if, if it, we're not getting the money back in return who is responsible for that because clearly they're, they're not tracking mm. it properly to understand okay this tip that we gave back in 1980 should be paying off this amount of dividends from 1990 on, like who is responsible for that? It's a good um, question. Well, that that's been one of the difficult aspects well, of it. BDC and finance departments should be tracking it. Yeah, and um, like I said, for example, we one, one example you'll see in the documentary, the city is supposed to produce reports on seven major pilots mm -hmm. every year and submit them to the state. And we asked for them, the city had not done them in four years. Mm -hmm. Since and then, 2018. Since 2018. Not and then when we asked for them, they suddenly produced them. And I would say that is one of, I think you've identified one of the biggest issues is that it's not really centralized. The mayor is right that in part, you know, the budget office or in part, you know, you can find some of it in the city's cap or the comprehensive annual financial report. And, you know, you can go to the BDC, but there is no centralized, like I would say warehouse of information especially when it comes to performance, which is what you're talking about, mm -hmm. like how is it doing? There is continuing disclosure by, to the bondholders in EMMA, which is a, a, a municipal bond um, website. So you can look up reports that are commissioned by Municap, done by Municap, but there's not like an office of tax incentive or an office, I guess the BDC would be the best, but they're not always the most transparent. And um, so I think you've identified what I would think problem. as a reporter, a serious problem in having an objective agency that's not like vested in it, like the BDC, to look at, collect all the data, aggregate it, 
publish it in a way for residents that's useful and also monitor the results and, you know, say, is this paying off? Like giving a, a frank assessment rather than a bias assessment, which of course, you know, BDC is going to say everything's great. And the, and the legislators who pass it are going to say everything's great. Well, but BDC wouldn't say everything is great if you have an administration that understands because BDC works for the city. And yes. so you have to then through finance, through your finance department, mm -hmm. make sure you get the accurate information, good or bad. Yeah. Well, remember, Mayor, like the BDC told me for years that my reports on the hotel were inaccurate because I reported the hotel was losing money. And now the hotel is being supported by the city budget and is a disaster. Now, of course, the pandemic hit and there are a lot of other mitigating factors, but nevertheless, you know, that was the BDC and the BDC used to beat up on me constantly about that. And so I don't know, I think, I think what you need like a kind of inspector general kind of agency that has mm -hmm. some autonomy to analyze it. Well, For the benefit general. of the taxpayers, excuse me? Yeah, but because the general the BDC office would be is, ideal. They do all kinds of audits. But right. the uh, BDC is putting up these projects and they're incentivizing them and they're telling the council, hey, these are great. I don't see them being the watchdog to come back and say, oh, this is failing or we're not getting the money from it. They're going to make sure they cover up to make it look like they, you know, they didn't look bad, make them look bad. <laughs> By, I, by so I understand that process. I completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. yeah, but it doesn't. It's not that it makes them look bad because it all is all going to depend on the climate of what's going on at the time. Mm -hmm. Just like the hotel, in the very beginning, it was very challenging, and I I, I knew it was going to go down. That's why initially we did have um, what's the guy from um, BET. Um, I don't know. I can't remember the Johnson. name. Yeah, Johnson. Johnson was strongly looking. Oh at, yes, I remember that. Mm -hmm. Right, and and I I don't rem I can't remember everything, but at that at that point, I don't know what kind of deal we could have worked out, but we probably should have tried to work out something. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I remember. We didn't need to be the owners. Yes, I remember quite well that you know in the last. Uh, session for testimony before the bonds were approved by the council, the BDC was the only party that testified. And, um, you know, so, I mean, I think the BDC, as Hassan points out, has a conflict of interest yes. in evaluating, you know, and, and giving the taxpayers information they deserve. I don't understand why people are against, you know, having objective, reasonably objective people look at this, but they don't seem to want it. They seem to say, you know, it's none of your business or well I, I think that's a general statement and that doesn't apply to everybody mm -hmm. i mean the developers really do have an incentive to not give this data out like for example they pro like uh they'll promise 1000 jobs are going to be created for example but what they won't reveal is that two-thirds of those jobs actually went to people who live in the surrounding counties or they won't they won't admit that you know 80 percent of these jobs temporary seasonable, seasonable jobs and weren't long-term employment. So it's also the, the, the quality of what we're getting back. Right. Well, but see, but that's that's where we as a city, and the, and the Hilton Hotel was a prime example of what we required for MBEs and WBEs, equity partners in the, the construction and development of it, hiring a, per, a person, and we drilled in on who are you hiring, tracking that that's the city's role to drill in on that and that's that has not happened in years mm. nobody's paid attention to the detail that's a good point mm -hmm. i would i would no i know that, that for a fact i can t i can tell you that because i could i'll call up somebody on the council to this day mm. to ask about are the are, are those contractors following the standards when you um go down um bg and e or somebody goes in the ground are they following the standards? Because it's clearly they're not. And they're like, oh, we have standards? Yeah, <laughs> there's standards that we have. I said, going up Emerson Avenue, I was like, this is horrible. Going down Lafayette, I'm like, what the heck? There are standards that were put in place when you go on the ground, how you have to put it back a certain way. Mm. And they're not following it. And so if you don't know this information, well, if you don't point. pay attention to the details, and that's part of the challenge. A lot I of think folks don't pay attention to the details. That's a very I think you point. make a really good point. I think 
I mean, from what I can tell, trying to dig up information that once the deal is done, I think the city pretty much lets it go, lets the developer do what they want. There's lets not it much. go and hopes for the best. Yeah. Now they do, but. And, and I'm not they, saying under your. We weren't saying under no, no, your. I'm, I'm just saying. Well, I, I, well, you you can talk to anybody on my staff, and they'll tell you that was probably <laughs> one of my problems. Pay too much attention to the details. Mm. And the problem is now you got all these young council people. And look, I was one of the biggest advocates for changing and having younger. Uh, but mm -hmm. a lot of them don't understand that process. Haven't really dug into it. There's nobody there mentoring them, showing them the ropes. Right. And that's my biggest problem with term limits because you're going to continuously get I agree. people in who don't got a clue. They don't even know what a bathroom is, let alone <laughs> what a tiff and pilot is. Right. right. Or yeah. standards and things of that sort. And that's a conversation that many people need to hear and, mm -hmm. and pay attention to. But as we wrap up, the documentary is coming out. When's it coming out? Where, is it, okay. where people can watch it and get more information. So we'll have a, we're having a premiere screening uh, on November 17th at the Real News headquarters, Real News Studios. 231 Holiday Street. Which is like two blocks down from City Hall. Mm -hmm. And the public is welcome. Just have the RSVP. Um, I, I can share an event right with you, uh, either of you. And, and we certainly hope you both will attend. Yeah. And um, after that, go, well, after that, we will be posting it on our YouTube account. Um, for anyone to watch. So it will be free for anyone who wants to watch it, comment. Um, obviously, the mayor already doesn't like it. Which is <laughs> I didn't clear. Say, I didn't, I'm not saying I which didn't Which is I clear. No, no. We, it's okay, though. I, I remember the days of City Hall when you used to yell at me. I'm used to it. It's just part of the process. <laughs> but, um, but, and, se but send me an email with the information because I know you text me. Yeah. I'll but I do email. better when people send me an email. You got it. And so, you know, it will be available for all the public. And of course, we would love to hear from anybody. We're going to create a transparency page where we post mm -hmm. all the documents that we obtained and the reports so that people can make up their own minds, you know, if they think we're not characterizing this correctly. But realize it took us five years to do this. Yes. And we have tried to be as sure as possible. But, you know, like the mayor said, the mayor's like, hey, Michael B is not going to talk to you. So that does present somewhat of a dilemma. I don't blame, I'm not saying I, I have any comment on whether why he won't or whatever, but you know, we've done our best to represent it as fairly as possible. Um, and, and, we, and we really hope that you'll come down and see it. We're hoping to have a lively discussion afterwards mm -hmm. to talk about what we've uncovered and yeah. the data that we found. And uh, I think there might even be some wine. Yeah. So, so. A little, a little some wine and maybe some appetizers. So yeah. Hope you show up and yeah. bring your friends. Yep. Who likes it? <laughs> I'm signing up for it now. So I'm oh, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. You got to send me an email. I will. Okay, so Sorry I can go you. on because <laughs> texting me stuff. When people text me stuff, I forget. I know. I understand. We will send you. Definitely. Email me. That way I had my calendar. And um, thank you. Thank you for having us on the show. We yeah, appreciate it. It was so, to discuss it. We really do appreciate you yeah. having us on. Yeah. So much. No, we appreciate oh, you coming on. Yeah, absolutely. This was a great conversation. I want to have you back afterwards so we can show parts of the documentary. That would be yeah, wonderful. Would, we, we can have a, a nice debate. Over yes, please. I, I would, would love I that. I would love that. So we'll yeah, we'll do that after. We'll 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 create a few clips to talk about, and then you know it'll be like old times. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. All right. Thank All right. you. Thank, thank you so much. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. All right, y'all. Both of you too. Yes, sir. I'm going to that. I want to see that. <laughs> so, family, we go Thursday, November 17th, 6 p.m., down at the Real News Network Studios, right down there below uh, 231 Holiday Street. Uh, right across, if you ever went down to pay your water bill, right across the street from there, that building. Right. And what was the restaurant? Is that restaurant still there on the corner, that black-owned restaurant? They shut it down. They shut it down. Oh, After wow. the pandemic, they never really got back up. And really, I don't think they really did a lot of great business. I think Real News Network is probably one of their, was their one of their loyal. Right, I customers. agree, I agree, you know, I agree. Didn't do a good job marketing, but it had some good food, though. So remember, I, the food was okay. I wasn't yeah, crazy about the food. You and me both. But, you know, I tried, it was black on. I'm choicy. I tried to show. I know, but I'm, I'm particular, like. Like um, darker than blue, I went to the uh, brunch there, 
Right. And even though they had a whole lot of different foods I didn't eat, but what I did eat, I enjoyed. I was like, oh, I have to come back. I mean, I've gotten a couple things at Darker Than Blue. I haven't been to the new one yet. Listen, oh, Charles Street? Yeah. You know, oh, I, the I, brunch I, is worth it. The brunch on Sunday, you have to make reservations. Right. But that brunch is really good. They have, it's more than just a brunch. Well, it's, it's case, really good. you know, I remember when Casey first started, I would always be down on Greenmount, you know, when Dark and the Blue first started. Before he moved up Bird Lane. Went to Hartford like, Road. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had a fundraiser on Hartford Road. The one on Hartford Road. So, man. But family, remember, next Tuesday, we're not on air. We're on air. On WEAA 88.9 FM. 2 to 4 p.m. Next Tuesday, Election Day. It's the day. If you haven't cast your ballot during early voting, you still have tomorrow on Thursday. And then it's election day is the only time that you can vote at 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. each day, early voting in election day. And uh, make sure you, you cast that ballot. It's a historic election. Yeah. We're finally going to get a black person elected statewide. Hallelujah. It only took how many years? How old is Maryland? Maryland is what? 1,500 years old? No, a couple hundred years. <laughs> but <laughs> it's ridiculous. But, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this election. I'm excited. Yeah. We have some great people. Yeah, me too. First female comptroller, two African Americans elected statewide, a great state attorney coming in from Baltimore City, a great young uh, clerk of the courts coming in from Baltimore City. We're going to make it happen. 234. 234 what? Years? Have we been in existence? Maryland's 234th anniversary of statehood. No, I think we're older than that. 234? What's that? 18-something? I put in how old is the state of Maryland, and the, the answer they gave was Maryland 234th anniversary of statehood, 1788, April 28th, 2022. Yeah, 17. I knew it was a 1700. After 1776, there's see the Constitution that we did it. Yeah, about 1780. That's about right. So, took that long to get a black person elected statewide. Great job, Meryl. <laughs> Anything else, Madam Mayor? I can't hear a thing you're saying. I don't know what happened. See, can't hear you. JJ came in and messed the whole demonstration up. <laughs> Huh? What about Nam? Can you there hear you me? go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, maybe maybe my ear thing went out because um. Now you just went out again. Civil rights and equity breakfast. What's that? And um, Wes Moore was a keynote speaker. Um, Dr. K was supposed to, but she was out of the country, and several mayors were there. Mayor O'Malley, Mayor Ronald Blake, Mayor Dixon, and Mayor um, Catherine Pugh. Mayor Young would have been there, but somebody did not provide him with the right information because he texted me and said he would have been there. Somebody um, missed the ball on getting him the, invitate, the information. It was interesting. Was it a good event? Yeah, it was a good event. Um, they didn't serve breakfast until a little bit after eleven, and I, of course I didn't. I just didn't wait around for that. Um, Jane Miller was one of the honorees. Um, Wabowski from UMBC, he and his wife, and um, the health commissioner um, for Baltimore City was another honoree. It was good. It was good. Sounds good. Mm-hmm. And you just had a great event as well, I heard, on Friday. Yeah, well, and yeah, 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 things, yeah, things, woof, man, it was a lot of work. But, yeah, no, it was, it went pretty well, it went pretty well. Um, so, yeah. I wouldn't I'm, know since I didn't get no ticket to it. Hey, we, yeah. hey, we, we were like, it was crazy, but, yeah. It looked good, though. Looked like it was a great turnout. Yeah, it was good turnout, good turnout. You know, of course, folks show up at the last minute, and you don't want to, Add on more seats than what you paid for because that costs you even more money. Because you know, everybody, um, 
Martin West is trying to make what they can make since they back in operation. So that's why I didn't make Larry's on Thursday night, Larry Young's retirement, because I just was so busy with that, getting that together. Right. But I heard that his was um, went well. Yeah, I heard the same as well. I, I couldn't make it. You didn't go? No, I was out. I had to go out of state that, that day. So I didn't get back to late Thursday night. And I'm scared to call Larry because I know he's going <laughs> to. He ain't going to try to hit. He is not going to hit. So, you know, I'm still trying to think of the words. <laughs> to say. But uh, I heard it was very, very nice. I he, had a, he, had a number, he had a whole lot of dignitaries that showed up. Yeah, I heard. I heard it was nice. Did you go, JJ? Yes, I, yes, I did, actually. Oh. And like the mayor said, it was a lot of dignitaries there. So It's election year. Yeah. It's about four, 400 and something people that were there. Oh, that's really nice. That's the number he said to me. Uh, Mine. Uh, so, and then I got a shout out this Saturday. Uh, two events during the morning and afternoon. The Black Men's Breakfast, they're holding the gala, um, honoring quite a bit of individuals um, uh, that, are, that deserve to be honored. Um, keynote speaker, guest speaker, uh, the incoming state attorney, Ivan Bates. Um, but that'll be a great uh, breakfast, and I think breakfast till lunch, uh, 40 hours. And then my group, No Boundaries Coalition, uh, under the leadership of Ashia Parker, that night, uh, Saturday night, they have their diamonds, denim, denim and diamonds annual fundraiser down there off uh, Utah, 1515 Utah place. So definitely check that out. Um, we'll put, we'll share it on the DMV daily news page so people can check that out. And if you can make it through, make it through, especially the, the, I'm telling y'all don't want to miss that denim and diamonds. thing. It's always the talk of the town every year that they have an event, no boundaries. So. So Definitely. wait a minute. So would you wear denims and diamonds? Yep. That's, you wear that's, jeans and diamonds? That's the concept. Yeah. I'm gonna wear <laughs> denim in, in Jersey. And what's the and what and it's at fifteen fifteen. Yeah, you know where um Oh, where old, the new building is? Right, that took over Jamal's old church building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That y'all how much is that? Huh? How much is it? Uh a hundred dollars. Or if you're VIP like you, 175 uh, for VIP swag and all that. The other, the morning event is $40. The breakfast, the black men's breakfast, you know, Bill Gooden and... and um, oh, yeah, yeah. Bill Brothers, yeah. And they're honoring quite a bit of individuals. Um, so that should certainly be a really good affair as well. So all day Saturday, we got some good things going on. So we'll see. And the Baltimore Ravens are number one in the division. And we just got the best middle linebacker in football from Chicago. That's what I heard. We're going to tear it up. I can't wait to get his jersey. Are you going to the game to Monday? No, I'm so mad because I was scheduled to go to New Orleans, stay for the weekend, stay over until Wednesday. And I had to change my plans for things that I could not control. I am so upset. Now, the only thing I'm not upset with is because I couldn't get my money back on some of the other stuff. I was able to on a hotel, but I didn't get the tickets right off the top. I had them reserved. And so, fortunately, I didn't lose on that for the game. But those tickets are cheap in New Orleans. Man, those tickets were going for like $80. And oh, I'm wow. talking about not way up here, eighty dollars, and you're down in the one hundreds. I'm like, damn, they well, must that's be good. Back. I know it's a lot of people from Baltimore going. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, a whole lot of people. Actually, the game I was gonna think about tr changing to go last game to Tampa Bay. Man, I looked at the tickets. Their tickets, on the other hand, they start at like two hundred fifty dollars, three hundred, all the way up at the top, tippy top top of the stadium, like. There's a minimum four or five hundred dollars for a good seat, three between three and five hundred dollars. There's a lot of Baltimore people there as well, and I was surprised at the Tampa game. But New Orleans is going to be packed with Baltimoreans. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! I know, quite, I know a lot of people going to that one, yeah. And so that was going to be my game of the year, so now I'm gonna to have to go 
to Pittsburgh like I usually do to the Pittsburgh game. Uh, I always got to pick one game out of the year that I go out of town to go see. And then, of course, Pittsburgh's comes here New Year's Day, uh, the right. New Year's Day game, and tailgating with Bates. We're going to have a uh, – so you want tickets to tailgate with Bates, go to the website, get those. You can tailgate with us outside and go into the stadium and watch us beat up on the Steelers. But, yeah, we looking good, Madam Man. We looking good. I see that you went to the game and didn't say – now, I had extra tickets – and you ain't tell me, and you ended up going to the game, the last game we had. What you mean? You had extra tickets. I told, remember, I told, I text you. I said I got because the media usually gives me tickets every now and again. They'll give me box suite tickets. You were trying to sell them because I was right. trying to sell them for you. But then I ended up was just gonna give them away because they, it was the Browns. Nobody wanted to buy the damn tickets. So I was just going to. I was trying to find somebody to give them away. Oh wow! I Good shoot. I knew. I knew. I didn't realize it because I could have definitely given them tickets away. Well, it worked out because Malik and them got to go and sit in my my seats, and me and my friend we got to sit down in the suite. So we all kind of benefited, you know, from it. And since JJ never told me what game he wanted to go to, and never reached out, I figured he was bluffing. Super Bowl, no. I'm Wait a minute! I thought JJ had reached out by now since he no. never went to a game. No, he he. Bluffed. No, I had COVID once and then I, I just let it go. All right, yeah, got a couple more games left. You can You talking about Super Bowl, man? What? It ain't gonna be in Baltimore, and I ain't getting you no Super Bowl tickets. I can tell and you Super- that. Oh, I remember the first Super Bowl. I had to get so many people tickets. Oh my goodness! What? Oof. And tickets were expensive. Super Bowls are very expensive. Hell yeah! I'm trying to think of how you got tickets for so many people. I, Super Bowl tickets sell out quick. I you- was hey I, I hey I, I through the Ravens and different sources. Dick Cash used to be really nice to me. I mean, I mean for people to buy, mm-hmm. but yeah. Oof. And then I was also in public office, so. Man, let me tell you something. Even as a season ticket holder, they only reserve a certain amount for season ticket holders because they got a certain amount for players and family and then a certain amount and then all the rest of them are gone because they don't control all of them. They only can each team. Oh, I know. I know, but I got them. I got I've got quite a bit tickets for different people. Oh, fancy you. Now you want to call them up now? They still giving it to you? (laughs) But Dick Cash is gone. Oh yeah, yeah. You ain't got no connection with that one. No well, more. I got. I, you know I, have a, I have a connect. I have a connection, but um, you since must, Dick has I gone, I just saw Juan at the game, and he was all up on the big screen. Happy birthday! Well, you know? Juan, yeah, but Juan is, knows the um, owner, right? Bashadi. So if Juan knows him, I know you can get all hold up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I ain't gonna comment. <laughs> At least you can call Robin and say, look, get that Negro on the phone and get him to do what he's supposed to do. Yeah, okay. You're right. Oh, we're going to leave that one right there. Huh? Yeah, leave it alone. <laughs> All right. I'm about to take my butt to bed. I am exhausted. So, until next week, we'll hear you 2, two to 4 p.m. WEAA 88.9 Election Day. Make sure you tune in to the Dr. K Show. Me and Dr. Dixon will be on there filling in for Dr. K. And as always, new promise begins with a new day. Therefore, the promise of tomorrow is greater than that of yesterday. Good night, family. Good night.